Hello, welcome to History and Lull. I'm Maritza Grooms. I'm here with my buddy Bob, and we are here with our buddy Sue Kim, who is the director of the Southeast Asian Digital Archives and the co director of the Center for Asian American Studies, among other things. She's also a very, very, um, let's see, engaged Lowell resident. How about that? <laughs> Yes, very busy, very busy woman. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. How are you today? Thank you, um, I'm great. Thank you so much, Maritza and Bob, for having me. Um, I'm very honored to, to be here. I've long been a fan of your show. I think knowing the history, local and national and global is, is critical um, and there's not enough of it. So thank you for all that you do. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's get right into it. So. We talk a lot, obviously, about history and Lowell. <laughs> so um, one thing that I feel like we definitely haven't really delved that deep into is Southeast Asian American history, right? Um, well, Southeast Asian history and American uh, Asian American history in terms of Lowell. So where should we start? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I like to start um, in Lowell. Um, when we're talking about Asian American history with Southeast Asian Americans, and particularly Cambodian Americans, right? Because, I mean, as you both know, the history of Asian Americans is very um, uh, diverse and complex. Um, and as with, you know, every, um, you know, immigrant group, um, but Southeast Asian Americans in many ways have been actually marginalized even within Asian American studies, right? So Asian American mm. studies is an interdisciplinary field that includes history and, you know, sociology and literature. And it's really started in the 1970s, really in the wake of civil rights and black power, um, you know, in, you know, as a, one of the many beneficiaries of you know, the work that uh, African Americans have done. Um, so, uh, but it really, for a long time, for a variety of reasons, uh, focused on East Asians, right? Um, Chinese immigrants coming in the, you know, the 19th century, um, you know, Japanese and Korean Americans um, after the 1965 um, Immigration Act. Um, but as people in Lowell hopefully know, uh, is that Southeast Asians have a very specific history. Um, particularly in relation to what we call the Vietnam War, but it's a much larger conflict that included not just various countries in Southeast Asia, but included the US, um, you know, Russia, China. I mean, there's really no way to talk about the late 20th century without talking about colonialism um, and the global effects of that and the Cold War, right? So um, the reason, right, that uh, Lowell, Massachusetts, has a large Cambodian American and then also, you know, smaller Vietnamese American, Lao American, Hmong populations is because of the refugees following um, the, the wars in Southeast Asia. Um, and because of these different uh, immigrant histories and re immigrant and refugee histories, like for example, my parents came in 1968 as um, students and, you know, obviously, you know, they're Korean Americans, I'm Korean American ethnically. Uh, there's a wide variety among Korean Americans in terms of income and education and, you know, political power and definitely political viewpoint and things like that. But as a group, right, we, we're, you know, we were also, you know, formed, shaped by colonialism and the Cold War. But as an immigrant group in general, right, like it's not as centrally uh, um, uh, motivated um, by having to flee literally from genocide and war, right? Yeah. So this creates very different conditions for the communities in the United States. Um, so, so the Southeast Asian, oh, sorry, Southeast Asian Digital Archive really um, seeks to not just preserve and share the histories of, the histories and stories of Southeast Asian Americans, but it really seeks to highlight their voices, right? Um, so. I was just going to ask, you were influential in starting that, right? Because it wasn't a thing before. Yes. So I really like to think of it as, um, I think Toni Morrison said, you know, if you achieve a level of uh, privilege and power, then you have to use that not just to help others, but also to 
you know, always check yourself and educate yourself, right? So until I moved to Lowell, I really didn't know, I mean, you know, about that much about particularly Cambodian Americans. Um, and while we were building the, South, uh, the Center for Asian American Studies, which started about 2013, um, Pitsamai Oi, who is my co-director now, she is Lao American, I learned a lot from both her and the community, really um, the importance of listening to the community and um, understanding their priorities, right? Mm. So one of the things that, you know, has been talked about for, for decades, really, is the need to collect the stories, the histories, um, you know, the you know, I'm a big fan of documents, right? Like institutional documents, images and things like that, videos of the community because, you know, Southeast Asian Americans have been here since the, mostly particularly from 1984, um, but there isn't a repository, right? There isn't a sort of one repository place. And so um, in, I think it was in March, 2015, and Bob was at that meeting. We had a community meeting of uh, faculty, librarians, um, community, and most importantly, community people to talk about what are the priorities, right? And out of that community meeting, it was very clear the priorities are materials in danger of being lost, damaged, or just thrown out in the trash, right? Like CMA, mm -hmm. CMAA moved a few years ago and they threw out file, you know, like just, you know, filing cabinets full of stuff, right? And I was like, oh no. Also the stories of elders, um, because mm -hmm. the elders are, you know, passing away every day. And another priority was to make sure that not just the, the wider community, but particularly, you know, the second generation, the third generations of Southeast Asian Americans uh, understand what these histories are, right? Because uh, again, as you both know, due to PTSD and trauma, but also just sometimes the generational cultural divide, but also not wanting to burden your children, people don't necessarily talk about these stories, right? Or talk about their experiences, say in the early days of Lowell with their children, right? So we were like, okay, <laughs> this is our mission, right? Um, and since then, um, it was really, you know, it was really, I'm a, I'm an implementer, <laughs> right? I mean, I, I listen, I listen to what what people sort of need um, and what they want, right? And then I, I help find ways to make that happen. And so through um, mostly external funding, um, you know, through the support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, um, you know, now the National Archives and other places, the Parker Foundation, we were able to um, build this archive. The thing that, as a historian, that always um, gets me excited about what you are doing is in trying, as I've done, to write labor history, you realize that the voices of the people on the line or the voices of the union organizers on the shop floor in some place in Lowell or Detroit or whatever it is are usually missing from the history, right? And I wish that there was a workers digital archive project in 1935 to capture the voices of workers in the sit-down strikes right and so archivists now um and people that are thinking about this work call it purposeful collecting mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and that you assess sort of a library in a local area or whatever and then you think about the bigger history and you say okay what's missing right and almost always what's missing is the kinds of stories that you that i know you're collecting, right? The margin, the people that they're not marginalized, they're every day involved and engaged, but they're marginalized in the way we think about at the abstract level, who makes history. Um, and so I, I like the always what you're obviously, um, what you're doing, because that's what you're, you've done. You've said, wait, there's this whole story that's missing. And if we don't collect it, if we don't get the stories of the elders, if we don't figure out these generational stories and sort of how the community gets shaped, they're gonna be gone. And 40 years from now or 50 years from now, when somebody comes to Lowell to write the history of late 20th century, early 21st century um, Lowell and the immigrant refugee stories, they won't be able to find them, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so if the, the fact that you're doing this is hugely important. Yeah. 
Thank you so much, Bob. And I, I mean, I will be honest, I think we can do a better job. I mean, that we are, you know, particularly looking for stories about education, right? And particularly the school desegregation in the 80s and the 90s. Um, we're also looking about stories into um, healthcare and a lot of the building of the community organizations, because those are the stories that I think the community knows, but they're not really, again, recorded and written down anywhere. So I really see that as sort of the next phase um, now that we exist. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I did a project for the Lowell Community Health Center to celebrate its 30th birthday anniversary and like cre help them create a timeline. And when we started working on that, it was really clear how much various um, groups within the, the Southeast Asian community, the variety of people came into the city, made demands on Lowell General and other places for um, healthcare that sort of fit the needs of the community and language issues and all sorts of things. And then it was very transformative for what the Lowell Community Health Center has become. And if you don't do that story, I mean, I, I, there were huge boxes of material they had that were just boxes of material. And so now it's a little bit more organized <laughs> than it was before, but it does get missed, right? And I think it, 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 it is what's made, to the extent that we can make the argument, which I think we can, that over 20 or 25 years, that community push has made the city a better place. We need to get that story. It's not perfect, we all know that. Mm -hmm. But it's not that somebody in the city council said, let's make this change and the change got made, desegregating the schools, one of your examples, that was not because some people on the school committee decided to ride on the bus, um, as they like to tell as though that's what happened, right? Um, yeah, so I, 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 I think that you, the work is so, um, so important that you're doing, there's no question yeah. about it. I mean, it's crucial. It's definitely, it, we need it. And, and I think about like the shows that we've done when we're talking about how immigrants and refugees have literally changed the fabric of Lowell and have enriched the city and made it so much better on so many different levels, whether it's, we already know arts and culture and especially the food, but also economically and politically. And, you know, we think about all of those things, but we don't have those, if we don't have those stories, then how will we actually be able to tell our history? And I think that's that, that's incredibly important. And, and that's why we're doing this show, right? <laughs> to be able to tell those stories. <laughs> so yes. the, 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 if we can switch gears a bit to the politics mm -hmm. and sort of um, along with working on the digital uh, archives and other things you're doing, you were one of several people in Lowell who ultimately had to resort to filing a federal lawsuit to get the city to rethink um, the way it elects the city council. Um, and that there's a long history of um, actually violations the Supreme Court years ago said voting patterns like in the city of Lowell were unconstitutionally violated, one person, one vote, Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act. and urban centers like Lowell, Worcester, Springfield in Massachusetts were very slow to change. But Worcester and Springfield already changed. Lowell was the laggard. Um, so maybe you can pick up the story a bit from there in terms of what prompted all of you to get together to, to do what you ended up doing. For sure. Um, I mean, I always say, um, I think we know this in our heads, but it's really true when you live it. Power is real, right? And power, almost never, very rarely, um, concedes anything without a struggle, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, as Bob said, that this has been an issue not only nationally, but also in Lowell, right? This was a ballot measure before, you know, it came up, changing the voting system was a ballot measure before it had come up in the city council, um, but real change had not come, right? So, um, a group of nine plaintiffs in 2017 of Asian American and uh, Latino uh, plaintiffs um, agreed to file a lawsuit against the city because as Bob said, this all at large city council voting system, you know, had been found multiple times to be in violation of the Voting Rights Act. Um, because uh, Asian and Latinx communities combined compose 41% of the city's population. Mm -hmm. right? 
all people of color together are almost 50%, right? I mean, it's 49% people of color, right? Uh, the school, the low public schools are two thirds students of color, right? This is incredibly diversity. This is why I love Lowell, right? Um, my parents, when my family came to visit me, they were like, do you work for the Lowell Chamber of Commerce now? And I was like, no, just Lowell is very interesting. There's a lot to, <laughs> a lot to like about Lowell. And, um, but uh, the, the city council and the school committee does not reflect that that the, does not reflect the communities, right? Um, until Dominic Lay was uh, elected to the school committee in the last last election, there had there had been no, uh, you know, uh, school committee members of color ever, right? Um, there had only been three uh, 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 city councilors of color, right? Um, which is, you know, outrageous. And this is exactly why. And the reason is because even if everyone voted. And we know that many, you know, people of color, immigrant, you know, um, communities don't vote for a variety of reasons, right? They can't get out of work, right? Like they're afraid of the government for, you know, very um, real reasons, having lived through a genocide, right? All kinds of things, you know, language barriers. Um, even if everyone voted, say, that means that fifty-one percent of the electorate could control all um, all the nine seats on the city council. Um, and all the school committee seats. And that's essentially what had been happening, right? But mm -hmm. knowing that we don't, that not everyone votes, right? Most of the seats, most of the voters are from Belvedere, you know, most of the city councilors from Belvedere, you know, and a few other communities. So it just seemed incredibly obvious, I think, to a lot of people, right, that this change needed to happen. So, um, so we agreed, you know, I, I, Again, I'm Korean American, um, but I was eligible as an Asian American, right? But during the lawsuit, I felt very important that we really foreground the voices of Cambodian Americans, right? Because they are the largest community here, as well as uh, the Latinx community. Um, so after two years um, of sort of you know uh, negotiations. Honestly, sometimes I forgot that the, the lawsuit was happening because it took so long, right? I mean, like, you know, five months would pass uh, and there would be an update. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's happening. Um, but in 2019, um, there was a settlement, the city settled um, and um, the settlement agreement, um, uh, it's leading to the district redistricting process, right? So what the changes will be is that the city council, um, as of the November, 2021 elections, right? There will, the city council will have 11 members with eight elected from districts and three at large councilors. The school committee will have six members with four elected from districts, um, essentially combining two of the city council districts, right? And then two at large uh, school committee members. Um, and for the city council, at least two of the districts must be majority minority, right? Which means that at least more of the 50%, 50, more than 50% of the voting age population must be either, you know, Asian American or Latino. But also I think for us, I can, actually I know this uh, uh, as a fact because the plaintiffs discussed it, it is important for us that all communities are represented in this process, right? So even though the plaintiffs for legal reasons had, were Asian American and Latino, we really believe that this is, um, that everyone should be represented. And then the school committee, um, um, there has to be at least one majority minority district for the city council, I mean, the school committee elections. So <laughs> this process, um, I really thank you for this opportunity to come talk about this. Sorry, my cats are suddenly deciding it's, it's time to <laughs> have fun. <laughs> suddenly they've all decided to, it's playtime and the dog is, is playing sheriff. Um, <laughs> um, so if we're going to do this by November, 2021, there's a lot of, there's some serious urgency, right? I think a lot of the process has been delayed due, due to the coronavirus pandemic. And I would say that to some extent that is understandable, right? But I would also say um, whatever the city does, it is very important that the communities who live in Lowell 
take the reins, right? Take the lead in sort of deciding uh, or shaping the districts, right? So for example, you know, I wanted to invite everyone, um, all the viewers and everyone, um, there's a coalition they're calling themselves, or we are calling ourselves Lowell Lines, right? Um, it is a group comprised, comprised of the lawyers for civil rights who, who were the lawyers you know, who represented us, the Lowell Alliance, um, the Cambodian Mutual Assistance Association, and the Latinx Community Center for Empowerment. Um, and they're sort of leading the charge to get community input into the district districting process. And we will have, we're going to have an open town hall on uh, Thursday, August 27th at 6 p.m. Um, it will be on Zoom. Um, if anyone is interested, you can contact me um, at, uh, my email is sue underscore kim at uml.edu, or you can contact LTC. Um, you know, they know how to reach me. Uh, and then there will be two more, at least two more community sessions, one in Spanish and one in Khmer uh, in September and through the fall. Um, the urgency for this is that if we're going to have these in place by November, we have to decide what the districts are by the end of this calendar year, right? Um, and there is an expert, right, a, a, you know, an expert in sort of population and demo, uh, demographics and, you know, electoral laws and things like that. But really, the, the community people, the people who live in Lowell, like we are the real experts, right? Like the people who live and work and have grown up in Lowell are the people who know, who are the real experts who know what the communities are best, right? The, so. So there's a couple things, I mean, I just wanted to emphasize, right, about this process of redistricting. One is, is that even though the plaintiffs for a variety of primarily legal reasons were Asian and Latino, right, that it's very important that all communities, you know, participate because we want all communities to be represented, right? This affects all of us. Um, also that what, you know, what we have here is a kind of historic opportunity to shape city hall right? Uh, right now, it does not reflect what Lowell looks like. Um, and we want to make it, you know, really reflect, you know, in the incredible diversity of our city. So imagine that representation for the community. Wow, that's such a radical idea, Sue. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's so sad when, I mean, things that seem very baseline are, you know, they're they do seem, I think, very radical and scary to some people, right? Um, even though it is really, you know, it's something that's not radical at all, right? It is about fair representation. And this has always been in the history of the city as various groups have come in, right? One of the, one of the hallmarks of when um, French Canadians start coming in in numbers is when finally you know, there's a French Canadian mayor or there are French Canadians on the city council or there, right? People measure um, some level of integration, participation, whatever you want to call it, uh, on the basis of those things, right? And you can go to the second floor of City Hall, walk around and look at the photographs of the various councils over the years. And you can see moments where, it's, where it changes, right? Where all of a sudden there's the first Portuguese person on the city council or the first Greek mayor, right, um, which comes, you know, in the middle of the 20th century or whatever it would be. And so, but now because everything is so hardened and lines are so drawn, it becomes much more difficult for all the reasons you described before for newer communities to, to sort of make that kind of a, of a leap. And at the same time, the city was out of step with the Voting Rights Act, with federal law, with Supreme Court cases. Um, and you would think under normal circumstances, rather than you have to ultimately, you and the other eight people spend two and a half, three years of your lifetimes, you know, arguing back and forth about doing the right thing, that they would have just said, okay, yeah, the law's on the side of the, of the plaintiffs, which it was. And so let's just, be, let's just sit down and figure this out. I always felt like they were trying to drag it out so they could get one more last hurrah of them <laughs> and it, I almost feel like they're trying to do it again, that they can then say, well, you know, we had the COVID, so it has to be delayed. And then they get 2021 and 
get to do the same thing all over again, right? And we have to be, I, I feel like what you're saying is we have to be vigilant and not like, despite the COVID, um, we have to not let that happen. I completely agree. I'm very concerned that there will be delaying tactics, right? And I think that it's it's be it's well past time um, that Lowell has a you know city hall that reflects its communities. Yeah, I think about this, and I, I sometimes we do this very like we'll do the con the contextual Lowell story, but I always think about it as Lowell is a microcosm for what's what's the history of the country and what's going on, and in terms of you know delaying tactics and. Um, things that are happening. We see uh, people trying to hold on to power um, in this really uh, interesting way. And it happens, right? Um, <laughs> when you're, when I guess when your power is threatened or your privilege is, you're suddenly aware or made aware of your privilege. It's, it's, it can be scary because, oh, wow. So the world isn't the little bubble that I live in. I, I just, I can't wrap my brain around it. Um, but, um, you know, I think that we as, you know, Lowellians, I know I'm, I don't physically live there, but I am always a Lowellian, was born there, and I'm very connected to the community. I think that we, the community, understands the need for representation. And we also understand the history of Lowell and that it's the community that does lead the way and that does make change happen and i and i'm hopeful and i'm hopeful that we'll be going forward and maybe one day we will have a city council that truly reflect, reflects the entire community and you know um that that's what i will say on that. <laughs> well i won't go further into how i feel about it but i did speak at the rally and i and i mentioned that about um you know immigrant in refugee groups, when they come into Lowell historically, we see them as Bob said, rise to power. And there has been a stalemate since what the 80s and the 90s. We haven't seen the city council truly reflect the community. And um, wouldn't we just exist better when all voices are are at the table, right? Wouldn't we be able to address everyone's needs and concerns um, in a in a real way? And that's what that's what city councilors are supposed to be doing, right? That's what our local leaders and the folks who we elect, who we choose, um, should be doing. So um, I'm going to use this one minute to urge everybody to register to vote if you haven't already. <laughs> Make Thank sure you. that you are Absolutely. watching and engaging in the city council meetings because your voice does matter. And, um, you know, uh, Sue, I want to thank you for the incredible work that you've done um, gathering these stories, just just in general, gathering the stories of this community, the Asian American community, I think is it, is so crucial. I think about a lot of the young girls who I served who they don't understand, you know, they don't, they may not know their history, they may not understand, you know, why their parents are the way that they are, and they push them to succeed in the way that they do. But these stories, maybe they'll hear them, you know, in five to 10 years, and they'll say, wow, okay, I have so much more respect and understanding for my culture and where I come from. And that's, that's how I feel when I hear stories about my own family and how and what they went through, like when I found out that my grandfather was a migrant farmer, gosh, wow. <laughs> um, but also the work that you're doing with this as a, as a private citizen, making sure that voices are heard. So thank you for joining us on the show today. Thank you um, so much. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll thank you, Bob. We'll do it again. We have more to talk about, so. So much more to talk about all the time. Gosh. So here's hoping that <laughs> the charters change, right? <laughs> when it needs to be and maybe one day term limits? Who knows? Find out in the future on another episode.